Thank you, Gloria. Please keep that part of God's Word open on your app or on your uh, physical fo um, Bible. And also, please have a look at the sermon outline, which should be in the outline. My name is Kamal. If we haven't met, in, in fact, if we have met, my, st my name still remains Kamal, but you get the idea. I'm Elliot, in fact, for today. Who here knew that Elliot was supposed to preach? He's got COVID. Yeah, so please pray for him. The symptoms are not too bad. Don't worry if he's not dying or anything, but still. It's interesting that just as we thought that we've achieved whatever it is, 95, 96% vaccines, we can open up, etc., etc., bang, we get another uh, bout, another wave of COVID. Let's pray and ask God to bless us by his word. Thank you, Father God, that you speak to us in Jesus Christ, your word made flesh. Thank you for your scriptures, your word written down. Please minister to us now, Holy Spirit, that we would love Jesus more, desire to uh, trust him more deeply, more thoroughly, and live more consistently for him. For the honor of your name, amen. Well, folks, it's coming up to the end of the year, and you know what that means. No, it means review time, when we get the credit that we deserve. <laughs> it's time for, now, those of us who are still at university, time for exams. I'm not sure, perhaps they've already finished. Trimesters throw all of the scheduling out. But it's time for us to get the credit that we deserve, as we have done of all of our studies. It's time to swat and then we can go on holiday and enjoy the time off that we deserve through all of our hard work. But for most of us who are working, it's time for annual review, which is also the time to get the credit that we deserve. After all, about this time last year, our bosses took us into the office and said, okay, here's your budget goals for this coming year, and perhaps here's your personal development goals. I want you to go on this particular course. Let's see if you can finish off these couple of subjects, and then you can finish your master's, or it's time for you to uh, become a proper solicitor. Let's do college of law or, or uh, become a chartered accountant, whatever. And here we are, we, we've achieved all of those goals. And it's really, really frustrating if we have worked really hard and someone else takes the credit that we deserve. You've probably heard the joke, right? Your boss turns up in a really nice new sports car or something like that, and you go, wow, nice car. And the boss says to you, yeah, if you work real hard and you meet all your goals, I'll get another one next year. <laughs> you get the point, never mind. A tough crowd, eh? You know. <laughs> it's we are you. We are used to demanding and getting the credit that we deserve, and that's the problem. We live in such a self-righteous, self-assertive, self-justifying, self-focused age that we don't pause to give God the credit that He deserves. In amongst all of the good things that we have done, pausing to give God thanks for the intellectual stamina to actually do our studies. Give God the credit for putting us in families where they can afford to send us for tutoring. Thank God, give God the credit for having stable families so that we actually get to like study and not be stressed where our next meal is coming from. Give God the credit for a, a good job. So not like someone who's constantly working shift or older men who have just been made obsolete through technological development and it's really stressful for them. How are they going to feed the family, etc., etc. Today's passage, Psalm 103, challenges us to give God the credit that he deserves. Because this, in this psalm, King David spends the whole psalm praising God for all of the good things that God has done, which is totally alien in a way that's really unusual for us who live in this self-satisfied, human-centered, secularized, world-focused society. So don't be surprised, okay? I give you permission to be patient with yourself. Those of us who already follow Jesus, be patient with yourself, but also honest to confess and admit how we tend to give ourselves credit and forget God. For those of us who are here, if you don't yet follow Jesus, just be alert, okay? This is one of those unusual, weird, different ways that people who follow Jesus, this is how we think. 
We are not just pretending. We're not being pious when we praise God and thank God for absolutely everything. That's what we really believe. We depend on Him and we give Him the credit for everything. And if you find that weird, excellent. You understand how we think. Well done. King David starts off, by the way, we know that uh, David wrote this because of the first couple of words in your translation. It says, of David, or maybe some tra translations say Davidic. That's actually Holy Scripture, okay? It's not from the Bible translators. We can be confident that King David wrote this psalm, and he says, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, from the heart, as it were, from the soul, Praise his, in, his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits, who forgives your sins. He heals your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with love and compassion. He satisfies your desires with good things. So your youth is, is renewed like the eagles. We don't know exactly what had happened to King David, but it sounds like he was sick. Heals your diseases. Perhaps he was sick almost to getting dead. Okay, Redeems your life from the pit and so on. And now he gives God the credit for making him strong and fit again, like a young man. Um, your youth is renewed like the eagles, okay? Now, folks, in order for us to understand and give God the credit, what he deserves, we need to understand what disease is. Okay, come on, we, we know what disease is, especially coronavirus and all that. We, it's, it's a virus, that's what it is. It's, and, and the reason we call it a coronavirus is it, it's got all those spikes so that it looks like a crown. I'm sure we've all seen the um, electron microscope pictures of the thing. In fact, we understand disease so well that we can even give it minute names as it evolves and changes and mutates bit by bit. So we're up to Omicron version 1A, B, whatever it is. I don't know. Like the, the immunologists and the virologists give each tiny mutation a name because we can even observe how it changes in, t in great detail. So of course we know what a disease is, and that's why we should can give ourselves the credit for controlling, finally, the coronavirus, haven't we? No, we haven't. Why is Pastor Elliot not here? Because he's sick. I wonder, now don't put this on Facebook, Kamal says coronavirus is like God's judgment on the world or something, all right? And that's, <laughs> but look, for me, it is kind of interesting that just when we relax and think it's all over, we keep getting hit with yet another wave of this uncontrollable disease. And, and look, you know, it's been inconvenient for us here at church. Not that, well, I hope it's not too inconvenient for you guys to be having me preach rather than Elliot. You can tell me after if it is. But, right, it, it's disruptive. I'm sure many of your workplaces have been disrupted yet again. Perhaps some of us here, it's just really scary and demoralizing. Are we ever going to actually kick this disease? Will I ever get to see my family face to face? Will I ever feel safe? Or will I always, is the new normal a constant low-level anxiety that I might get sick or even worse, that I might pass on this disease to an elderly relative and kill them? Now, if we don't understand disease from the Bible's perspective, I put to you that that actually is the case. After all, perhaps the virus is more evolved than us. We give ourselves credit for having all these variety of, uh, of vaccines against the virus. I mean, we've got the Moderna, we got Pfizer, we got AstraZeneca, we got whatever the Russian ones are. What is it? Sputnik or something? The funny name for the Russian ones. There's the Indian background one. The whole world we have created, we can give ourselves credit. The virus keeps outmaneuvering us. What is disease? Disease is God's judgment on the world in general, not judgment just on non-Christians, not judgment on particular sinners or anything, that we are not in charge, that we cannot and should not give ourselves credit 
that we are in control of this world and that we can therefore give ourselves the good life, the ultimate life, that we can live well. No, we can't. We rely on Almighty God, the God of Israel, Yahweh. Those of us who are regulars at church, you know that the capital L-O-R-D means Yahweh, the Lord of Israel, the particular God of Israel, not just some God out there. Okay? David knows that God heals us. And we should give God the credit for all of the good things that heal our diseases, like all the, the, the um, vaccines that have been developed. It's actually a blessing from God how quickly they were developed, like one and a half years or something. That's amazing. It took, took decades to develop flu vaccines. It took a uh, hundred years or whatever to develop smallpox vaccines, etc. So praise God. Let us give God the credit for giving so many scientists and immunologists and virologists and every other ologist that is necessary, okay, the knowledge and the skill. Let us give God the credit for hundreds of years of careful medical research so that we could develop the vaccines. Let us give God the credit for the fantastic medical facilities that we have here in Australia and in Sydney and perhaps let us pray for the rest of the world where they don't have it. Perhaps some of us know, look I'm sure in a group this size, some of us know someone whose life was saved through ventilators. For my dad, it wasn't exactly life-threatening, but it sure was better for him that he got the antiviral treatment when he and I got the COVID. For me, it was annoying, one day of quite bad symptoms, then I got better. My dad's elderly, and he's fragile diabetic. It could have been dangerous for him, but as soon as he got symptoms, there is a very specific antivirus that has been engineered to attack this virus. What knowledge! What skill goes into that? So it's like an uh, army inside you coming as backup to fight the virus. That's the way the medical specialist explained it to us. It's fantastic. Dad's uh, alive and well, fit and healthy and singing in a choir for Christmas. So let us give God the credit for all of the good things that he does as he heals our diseases. But let us also, in humility, acknowledge that only Jesus Christ, the risen one, can heal us forever. Remember Jesus. He miraculously, genuinely healed people, like with a word, with a moment. Jesus did, by his supernatural power, because he is the Lord, the God of Israel incarnate. He did, by his supernatural power, what we cannot do even with all of our human engineering and science, etc. This is what it means for us to give God the credit that he deserves. It doesn't mean being down on science. It doesn't mean being like some sort of uh, embarrassed or mocking or denying the achievements of humans. It does mean recognizing that behind all of this stands Almighty God. And in that in a humble way, being able to accept our own fragility. More of that in a moment, but one of the fragilities, folks, that's coming soon, all of those floods in western New South Wales, okay? Pray for those places, you know, pray for safety and so on. But you know what? I'm worried that pr food prices are going to go up because crops have been damaged. Now, perhaps for us here, we are relatively wealthy and comfortable. We have safe and secure jobs. Let us pray for those who, like I said, the poorer people who don't have stable jobs, okay? Those who are homeless, living rough because they face domestic violence at home or because of mental illness and so on. It, with the increase in the cost of living, for us it's just annoying. Our takeaway lunch our takeaway dinner tonight has gone up by one or two dollars. Wah, life's hard. But folks, for some people, it's going to be starvation territory, okay? It is the Lord who, verse 5, satisfies our desires with good things. Let us pause to recognize, to give God the credit that the food on our plate comes from Him. Let us recognize that the good weather so that the crops grow or the poor weather, that the crops are destroyed. These are from his almighty hand. There's an old hymn. 
It's kind of fun to see these hymns being refreshed and like old hymns given a new style with, uh, and that's really good. I say, Aaron, here's a bit of a challenge for you, bro. Maybe we can put this old hymn to music. Anyone know this one? We plow the fields and scatter the good seed on the land. Yeah, Uncle Joe knows. You don't count, bro. You're even older than me. Now, so, but um, anyone, any of who's not Uncle Joe know the next couple of lines? But it is, no? Go, Uncle Joe. All right. Okay. But it is fed and watered by God's almighty hand. There you go, musos. Let's maybe, you know, jam up a, a modern version of that. For a, a, that, so that we can sing it, and give God the credit for the food that we eat. Everyone, saying grace before a meal is counter-cultural. It is an attack on the selfish uh, culture of today. You might not think of that, but it is. Why? Because we are giving God the credit for our food. I worked hard for that. I deserve to, what I eat. I deserve the fine dining. I deserve... No, we don't. And God can send the flood, as it were, and take it from us. So let us be like King David. Let us rejoice and give God the credit for all the goodness and the wholesomeness that we enjoy in this life. Okay? Again, not mocking or denying the human effort that goes that in plowing the fields, the human effort that goes in creating clean water, in um, creating the healthy food, the safe, safety requirements that go into safe food, etc. We don't need to mock that, but behind all of that stands a good God. Let's give Him the credit for all of the goodness that we enjoy in this world, and then let us give Him the credit for forgiving our sins and removing our sins so that we can enjoy eternal life. Let us read verses 6 to 12. Verse 6 to 12 of Psalm 103. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He makes known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Folks, when we read verses 6 and 7, those of us who know the Bible, when we think of God's righteousness and justice and revealing to Moses the law, we think of the requirements, the demands that God puts upon us to live his ways. Look, that's not entirely wrong, but in the context here, what King David seems to be focusing on is the way that God has promised to forgive those who put their trust in the sacrificial system, because that also was part of the law. Here, um, what King David seems to be referring to is the second sacrifice of the Day of Atonement. Again, those of us who are familiar with the Bible, we know in Leviticus chapter 16, the great Day of Atonement, and perhaps, uh, and even we've mentioned it in today's catechism, how Jesus Christ, why did the Redeemer have to die? Why didn't Jesus just come and teach us how to live a better way? That's what Islam says. That's what the Muslims think, that Jesus is a prophet. Okay? Yes, he is a prophet, but he's more. Why could, that's what the Hindus think. A Hindu would be very happy to accept Jesus as their guru, to teach them how to worship properly. But they stop there. Okay? Why did the Redeemer have to die? It's because he was the first sacrifice of the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 16, where the priest takes an animal, a goat, and puts it on the altar and kills it in a very literally bloody and visceral and visual way, showing that this is what sin deserves. This is the result, the punishment for turning our back on Almighty God, the one who created us and to whom we owe literally everything. Now again, because we live in a self-focused, arrogant, self-righteous era, don't be surprised, even those of us who follow Jesus, if you sort of squirm a bit and think, you know, just death for sin, that's a bit intense in it. Folks, think of it this way. Imagine the, the nation, if it was one group of people on earth, 
who were closest to God. Imagine a gr that group of people who had God himself had told them, this is what it means to follow me and this is what it means to worship me. And then imagine the religious leaders of that nation. Would, wouldn't you think that that nation, if God came to visit that nation and those religious leaders would be the ones who would recognize him and would bow down and worship and would commit their lives to him. But folks, you know what I'm talking about, right? What did the Pharisees and scribes and teachers of the law, that very same law that King David has just referred to, what did they do when they were confronted by Jesus Christ, God incarnate? They murdered him. They hated him. He threatened them. And that is the effect of sin. We hate God. We want to murder God. Because that's what the most righteous, supposedly godly people did. We tend to give ourselves credit that we don't deserve. We think of ourselves as good people, as even good Christians. Because we come to church, oh, I've reserved my sexuality until I got married, not like those um, uh, non-Christians that sleep with everything um, that moves. I've, like, I know to worship Jesus properly. I believe in one God, not like those Hindus who worship, worship anything that moves and lots of things that don't. We tend to give ourselves credit that we are good people even good Christians. Let us remember that it's the religious people that murdered Jesus. But the amazing thing with that is that Jesus took that as our sacrifice, but all of that is a bit of background for today's passage. Here, when King David talks about he, that, that God removes his sin as far as the heavens is from the earth, as far as the east is from the west, he's talking about the second sacrifice. Who here has heard of the scapegoat? Anyone heard of the scapegoat in Leviticus 16? Again, Joe, you don't count, bro. You study theology, you're a preacher. Come on. Who else? All right, Jaden, what's the scapegoat, bro? Yeah, just tell us what you remember. Yes, air high five, bro. Woo, well done. Okay. The scapegoat, the word scape comes from to escape, okay? Except the scapegoat doesn't really escape. So, the priest would kill one goat, but symbolically, just like Jaden said, the priest, on behalf of the people of God, Israel, right, representing Israel, he would put all of the sins of the people on the scapegoat, symbolically. You don't see anything happen, right? And then, the scapegoat is led out into the wilderness, just like Jaden said, and it dies in the wilderness. Now, just put yourself in the shoes of an Israelite, man or woman, right? And so you, are, you see the priest remove your sin, put it on the scapegoat. The scapegoat's gone away. Yes, my sin has been taken away. There is nothing hindering my ministry to my relationship with Almighty God. I'm free, I'm free. That is how King David feels right here. As far as, the as high as the heavens are above the earth, as far as the east is from the west, he has removed, he has taken away the guilt, the shame, the fear, the judgment of our sins. Folks, let us bask, let us rejoice in how Jesus removes, he forgives in a judicial way, absolutely. But here, God is inviting us to imagine that he kind of symbolically Metaphorically takes away, but really takes away our sin. It doesn't block our relationship with God anymore. Because Jesus, when he was crucified and buried, our sins were crucified and buried with him. And also, when he arose, he rose to overcome our frailty. So let us give God the credit for caring for us in this world. Let us give God the credit for removing our sins in Jesus. And let us give God the credit for in Jesus' resurrection, overcoming our fragility, our frailty. Verses 13 to 18. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we're only dust. As for a mortal's his days are like grass. He flourishes like the flower of the field. The wind blows over it, it's gone. Its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant 
and remember to obey his precepts. When God created us as humans, he created us with a vulnerability and a, the, a need to rely on him, but God intended us to live with him forever, to enjoy life with him forever. Adam and Eve in Genesis one, uh, chapter 2, they were not meant to die. They were meant to party with God and rejoice with God and have children okay, forever and ever filling the earth and ruling over the earth as humanity, God's vice regents. That's the joy and pleasure and adventure that God intended for humanity. So why do we get sick? Why is it so frustrating? Why do our plans never work out? Etc., etc. Why is there even death? Because we have turned away from God. But Jesus Christ. Jesus, when he came to earth, he shared in our fragilities. Think back, those of us who are regular at church, remember even what the earlier questions, a couple of the earlier questions of the catechism said about how Jesus, the Redeemer, is fully human. There, was, um, there, were, there have been one of the catechism questions, even uh, one of the catechism answers, talked about how in his full humanity he can sympathize with us, yet overcome sin. That means, and look, you know, scriptures are fairly straightforward on this. Jesus understood our frailty. He understood our weaknesses. Sometimes when we think of Jesus, we say, oh yeah, but he's God, you know. What, he doesn't get it. No, he totally gets it. The Bible doesn't tell us, did Jesus ever catch flu, okay? Doesn't say. But he could have, because his bodily immune systems would have been just as normal as us. Did Jesus ever stub his toe and go, ow, okay? Did he ever have a broken bone? Well, it says none of his bones were broken, but that means a cross. We don't know, okay? But you understand my point. Just like King David suffered the fragility of becoming sick, perhaps even close to death, and then, praise God, he recovered, right? Which is the occasion for this psalm. Jesus could have. And so, folks... Do not despise and mock this Jesus. He understands. Bring all of your fragilities. We can bring all of our woes, all of our anxieties. We're focusing on physical ailment because that's the context of this psalm. But bring your concerns about work. Perhaps your, I said, I've been assuming that we are all relatively like uh, stable in our jobs and so on. Let's not assume that the whole global economy is in spasm because of this useless and an unnecessary and tragic war in Ukraine and because of the ongoing effects of coronavirus. Perhaps your jobs are fragile. Bring that to God. He understands the fear that you won't be able to pay the bills, that you won't be able to like, have the, the dignity of a career that you expected to have. Are you in relational strife? Is, it, is your family, your parents, or your spouse, is there a fracture there? Bring all of those fears to God. Bring them to church ministers as well. We are here to help you. But Jesus understands. He knew what it, was, what it felt like to be misunderstood by his parents. Luke chapter 2. He, he knew what it was like to even, as an adult, have his mother and brothers say that he's lost it. He's nuts. Mark chapter 4. Bring your woes to Jesus, and then he can give us the everlasting life. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those of us who fear him, who worship him. Jesus Christ is the risen one who has finally overcome completely all of our fragilities. Again, because we tend to give ourselves the credit, we think that we can overcome human limitations through technology. So let's, you know, cryogenic freezing, and then sometime in the future I'll be raised to live forever. Or, like, we, through uh, cyborgs and through replacement of body parts, we can live forever. Or through some sort of enhancement so that I become a, an android or a, a, a superhuman, a transhuman. Perhaps, now here's a really interesting one that I read and I'm like, whoa, this is full sci-fi. Getting uploaded digitally so that we transcend our actual physical limitations and become like a computer program. And then get squirted out into the universe of something, I don't know. Okay, we give ourselves credit. Everything I've just said is sci-fi so far, okay? But we give ourselves credit that we can overcome human limitations. Trust Jesus. He's overcome death itself. 
and he has done it in real space and time history, which is not fiction. The people who saw Jesus rise from the dead, or rather saw his resurrected self, nobody literally saw Jesus the moment he rose, they did not expect it. Folks, why did the women go to the tomb? Genuine question. Someone just say, they went to the tomb to do what? Did they go to watch like the spectacle of Jesus rising from the dead? Go on, somebody really say, why did the women go to the tomb? Someone gave a spicy answer. Go on, say it loud, come on. Do, they went to dress to like take care of a dead man. They did not expect him to be risen. How did the disciples react? I won't expect you to remember this. How did the disciples react when the women went back saying the tomb is empty, we saw the risen Jesus? They laughed at him. Ha, ha, ha. You're fantasizing. You're, see, you're stressed out women. These are like blokes would have been a bit misogynist back then. You're stressed out women. You're just imagining it. The disciples didn't expect it. Nobody expected it. Jesus Christ has overcome our frailty. The one who understands and inhabited our frailty. He has overcome it and now when we put our trust in him, he, we can live forever. Not in these dusty bodies that are like um, the, just the grass on the field. And again, it is good for us to feel the limitations. Perhaps those we, whether we trust Jesus or not, perhaps we are truly anxious about this coronavirus, the economy, okay, wars and rumors of war, and it's just really stressful. Do not let it, do not fear, do not let that anxiety like gut you. That is not good. Bring it to Jesus, bring it to your community group, bring it to other Christian friends, and let us discuss those fears. But folks, the humility, humility is not the same as fear, okay? The humble acceptance of our limitations and a joyful trusting in Jesus, that can only be good. Because that will motivate us to remain faithful to God's way, his covenant. Just let me quickly explain verse 18. Those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. I briefly said that back at the beginning when uh, King David talks about uh, God's righteousness, Yahweh's righteousness that he taught to Moses. It's true that God really did want the people of Israel to incarnate the godly life. That's what the law is, okay? Back in the, what we call the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, what God wanted was for the people of Israel to learn his ways and in their relationships with each other, demonstrate to the whole world, look, this is the good life, all right? This is what it is to live with Jesus, well, with God as your boss, as your king, and this is why it's so good for us. Our whole society will prosper, not just financially, but in terms of individual health and wholesomeness and relational and family health and wholesomeness. There should be no poor people amongst you, etc., etc., so Israel was sort of, if I can use this language, supposed to incarnate the good life. Jesus incarnates the good life. He is the new covenant. In his death and resurrection, he gives us that good life. So let us grow in our Christ-likeness. What does it mean for us to be godly, to fear God, to trust him and to obey his precepts? Let us learn from Jesus and show forth the fruit of the Spirit, the godly life, the Christ-like life. And one of the ways, one of the ways we can do that is by being patient when we don't get the credit we deserve. Again, because we live in such a selfish and aggressively assertive age, it's easy for us, and even those of us who follow Jesus, okay? Look, it's not good, but be patient with yourself. If, so that joke like, you work hard, I get the sports car, you have the right to get angry because that is unjust, that's okay? But control your temper. As people who follow Jesus, we're going to, at the end of the service, towards, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. One of the ways we can keep God's covenant, one of the ways we can show the world the good life is we don't just let people take advantage of us, but don't get angry. Don't lose your temper when we don't get the credit we deserve. We can genuinely forgive. We can be kind to people, okay? Still, challenge them. This is just wrong. But 
we can obey the last couple of verses of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, okay, at the end, the Apostle Paul says, do not seek vengeance, but leave room for God's wrath. Now, that's interesting language, isn't it? Leave room. It's as if God's job is to take vengeance, just like it says the Lord seeks justice and righteousness for the oppressed, okay? And if we get angry because we haven't got the credit we deserve, and we seek vengeance, it's as if we're bumping God out. Shoving him away and doing his job. Sorry, job. You, uh, sorry, God, you suck at your job. I'm going to take over and I'm going to do your job for you. That's just rude, all right? One way we can give God the credit he deserves is when we don't get the credit we deserve. Being kind and forgiving, you don't have to just let people take advantage of you, but being patient and gentle. Wouldn't that be just so refreshing and good in the angry age and like frightened cancel culture era that we live in? So folks, in this time, in this era, when we seek to always get the credit we deserve, let us give God the credit that he deserves. Let me finish by just reading Verses 19 to 22, when King David invites the whole universe to praise God. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, his mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I hope, folks, you feel like giving God the credit now. I hope you feel like thanking him for our health, our strength, for the food we eat. I hope you feel like thanking him for Jesus. I hope you feel like thanking him for the eternal life. I hope you feel like thanking him for the challenge and adventure of living for him in this sad, scary, angry world. Are you motivated to praise the Lord? I hope so. I can't do it. I can't do that motivation fundamentally. The Holy Spirit can. But that is what this psalm invites us to do. It invites us to praise the Lord, to give God the credit that he deserves. Let us pray. Thank you, Father God, that you give us the opportunity to actually praise you. That is a wonderful thing. All the other, the rest of creation praises you in a dumb and mute way. We can praise you with our voices. We will praise you in a moment in song. We ask that your forgiveness for our tendency to give ourselves the credit that you deserve. We thank you for Jesus. He took the demerit. He took the discredit that we deserve. We thank you that he is risen as your final covenant faithfulness. And he gives us the eternal life that he deserves. He de uh, should live with you forever. But we, should, we don't deserve. He gives it to us for free. Help us to live your way especially when we don't get the credit we deserve. Help us to constantly live our life ar lives around you, thanking you for every good thing. And in this, may this be a rightful challenge to this selfish but also scared and depressed world. Give to us this joy that we would point the world to you and call other people to give you the credit that you deserve. For you are worthy of all praise. Amen.